Hello, my beautiful people. My name is Oso Katel. Welcome to another episode of Basic Nigerian History. Now, last episode, we discussed how Nigeria became a nation that experienced not just one, but two coups in a short amount of time, and the events that eventually led to the Igbo people wanting to be apart from Nigeria as a nation. This episode, we're going to discuss Nigeria's civil war. Strapping. From January the 4th until January the 5th, 1967, Yakubu Gowon, who was now the Supreme Commander and Head of State and Lieutenant Colonel Chuku Umeka Odumwegu Ojuku, who was the Governor of the Eastern Region, met to negotiate the East remaining in Nigeria after the Igbo massacre that happened in the North. They produced vague, loosely worded resolutions. Gowon left thinking all was settled, but Ojuku thought he was now given power to do as he wished with the East. This led to Ojuku announcing that he would handle all of Eastern administration independently. And Gowan, not being happy with this, responded by creating a blockade around the southeastern coast and putting economic sanctions in place. This inevitably led to Lieutenant Colonel Emeka Ojuku declaring the East independence on the 30th of May 1967 and he became the military governor of the Republic of Biafra. Gowan, however, wasn't prepared to let the East go. Firstly, he sincerely believed in Nigeria as a whole. Secondly, he was afraid that if he let one ethnic group go their own way, then soon everyone would want to go their own way as well. And thirdly, and most importantly, the eastern side of Nigeria had 67% of all the oil. So the civil war began, a brutal and deadly war in which approximately 3.5 million people were killed, mainly starving children. Ojuku's side claimed that the federal military government, the FMG, wanted the genocide of the Igbo people, pointing to the massacre that happened in the north as evidence. And this earned him the support of the public and international nations. Gowan's tactics to fight the East unfortunately supported that rhetoric. He focused on isolating and economically depriving Biafra in the hopes that they would quickly surrender. Immediately after Ojuku declared independence for Biafra, Gowan split Nigeria from its previous three states, North, East and West, into 12 states, giving the minority groups that had been clamoring for their own states since before the independence exactly what they wanted. He also splits the Biafra Eastern region into three states, East Central States, River States and southeastern. Only the east central area was mainly Igbo and it was also landlocked. Furthermore, most of the oil wasn't in the east central states, they were in the other two. This was largely symbolic however, as Biafra controlled the entire area and didn't agree to the split. It should be noted that it did weaken the support for Juku amongst non-Igbo citizens in the region. Gowon continued military blockade of the coast and made it difficult for Biafra to ship food in and out of the country. He did allow regular shipments from humanitarian organizations, however. Gowon also managed to convince the Organization of African Unity, aka the OAU, that the Nigerian Civil War was an internal conflict and to respect the sovereignty of the federal military government by not interfering. In the beginning, Biafra had successful military campaigns and invaded the Midwestern region of Nigeria and even threatened an invasion of the Western region. The FMG, Federal Military Government, forces began to push back and slowly but surely drove them back into deep Biafra territory. By October 4th of 1967, the FMG occupied Enugu. By October 18th, the FMG took Calabar. It seemed the war would easily end after that, but Biafrans didn't give up. They moved the capital to Umuahia. Umuahia. The fighting slackened and Kowon relaxed a little, believing that the economic sanctions he had put in place would cause Biafrans to rise up against their leaders and soon stop the war. However, the starvation and economic hardship played right into Ojuku's rhetoric of genocide and he used the hardship as evidence to create a large propaganda campaign and persuaded both the Biafrans and the international community that federal military government actually 
did want to kill all Igbos. Kowan refuted this, using the millions of Igbos living in other areas of Nigeria as well as occupied cities of Enugu and Calabar as an example. Those Igbos weren't dead, he said, but it didn't really work. At first, the international community stayed out of it. UK and USA were on the fence and didn't show support for any side. I think they weren't fully decided on which outcome would benefit them the most yet. They did refuse to help the federal military government, which angered Gowon. After all, they created this entire mess and now they were just going to sit back. They wouldn't sell heavy artillery and other weapons to the federal military government in fear of alienating Biafra who controlled Delta and therefore the oil. The FMG turned to the Soviet Union who were more than willing to help. In 1968, members of the OAU like Tanzania, Gabon, Ivory Coast, Zambia formally recognized Biafra with constant reports of genocide coming out. Other European and Asian countries also expressed solidarity with Biafra, although not officially recognizing it. France and Portugal strongly supported Biafra and even provided them with training, supplies, aid, logistics and so on. Unlike the UK and the USA, both countries believed permanently destabilizing Nigeria was in their best interest. Portugal was fighting to keep control of its own African colonies and if Nigeria was preoccupied, it couldn't help in the liberation movement of these Portuguese colonies. France feared Nigeria becoming a serious regional influence, believing it would weaken its influence in its own former colonies. Israel saw Biafra like itself, a state surrounded by enemy states and expressed solidarity and China saw a chance to challenge the USSR, so they expressed sympathy with Biafra siding against the Soviet Union who supported the federal military government, although they didn't do anything else. The Catholic Church, to which almost all Igbos were a part of due to the colonization efforts in the past, worked with the International Red Cross to provide regular humanitarian aid, food, medical aid and other non-military aid. All of this contributed to the prolongment of the war. The supplies from the Catholic Church and the support from outside Nigeria helped Biafra to limp on much longer than it should have. In January of 1968, Gowon announced a change of the country's currency, making all of the currency that Biafrans amassed soon to be more or less worthless. Eventually, this led to the collapse of the Biafran state and the federal military government troops overran it in December 1969 and in January 1970. Ojuku fled to the Ivory Coast, claiming the revolution is not dead so long as he is alive. The war ended on January 12, 1970. Major General Philip F. Young, whom Ojuku had left in charge, surrendered. Approximately over 3 million people were killed. Most of them were civilians that died from starvation. It was a very dark time in our history. And that's it for this episode. I'm just going to leave it there. A quick recap of what we learned in this episode. This episode, we learned about the Nigerian Civil War. What happened in it, how it took place, how it started, how it eventually carried on, the sides that the international communities took and how the federal military government handled the situation back then. We also talked about how it ended and mainly the casualties being mostly civilians who died from starvation. Next episode, we're going to talk about more things. Guys, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, share this video with your friends. If you want to support us, we have a Patreon. The link is in the description below. Go ahead and click that link to support us. Dr. Katel loves you all and I am out. Thank you.